Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for uh, the shenanigans. Uh, this is not some uh, some bonus episode, this is a real deal, this is the main episode. And, uh, and we've got a good one for you today. Uh, this is Derek Bourgeois joining me for a look at the movie my bloody valentine in a season i have come to think of as april slashers uh, when we do this again next year knock on wood um i will actually have the name for it uh at that point this year is just like i kind of want to do some 80 slashers while i don't confine myself to doing just 80s movies that's kind of how it worked out this year and i i have no regrets so uh, I think you are going to enjoy this conversation as I did, uh, as you will hear me talk about uh, in the episode. I came to My Bloody Valentine a little bit late, and I really enjoy it. I think it's just a, a terrific movie, but I won't spoil my feelings about the movie. I'll spoil my feelings about the movie in the next section. So uh, anyway, thanks for joining us here on The Dark Parade, and, uh, and here it is. Me and Derek talking My Bloody Valentine. Enjoy. All right, welcome back, everyone, to uh, another edition of The Dark Parade. Uh, we are, of course, talking with uh, Derek Bourgeois, and we are going to jump into this because already off, uh, off the air, we have started in on the discussion of My Bloody Valentine and stuff that you, dear listeners, ought to know. Uh, much like Alanis Morris said, you ought to know what we were talking about. So... Uh, obviously, Derek, thank you for doing this. You're always the best. Thanks for being here. You're welcome, Bo. I'm glad you brought up Alanis Morissette because you're keeping it Canadian with this episode. That's the plan, is to do no purely Canadian references throughout the, the episode. So, we were briefly talking about director of My Bloody Valentine, the remake, which, directed by Patrick Lussier, and we were talking about the movie he did Trick that was... Your theory is that that was sort of a, uh, a a reinterpretation of a script written for Halloween Three, the Rob Zombie series. Yeah, and it, it, you know, kind of the, the way that it was going to go down with that movie. Uh, without giving too much away, if you haven't seen Trick, is you know because like they were going to try to explain how Michael Myers could be in one place and then five minutes later be in another place. And it was actually kind of a cool idea and I kind of liked it a lot a little bit better than, you know, like all that bullshit with the Cult of Thorn bullshit, you know? They, sure. They're like, oh, is he supernatural or what, how, how is he there? You know, why is he over there? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I saw the remake of My Bloody Valentine before I ever saw the original of My Bloody Valentine. Which, uh, yeah, kind of. The, I actually didn't see it, but I, you know, the thing is, I see the trailers for this, and I made it a point to watch the original before I went to go watch that, and man, those 3D effects do not hold up. No, 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 and I've actually got the 3D version of My Bloody Valentine because back in the day I had a plasma you know 3D TV which I think mm -hmm. the power supply went out. I, I still have it but it doesn't work and uh, you know well, well one of these days I keep promising myself I'm going to get that repaired just so I can watch all those fancy Blu-rays again but more importantly Derek I remember seeing My Bloody Valentine, the remake, and thinking, oh, that's that's not terrible. And, I, you know, I enjoyed it for the most part, enough that I, I you know, had the Blu-ray of it. Maybe I just liked the 3D part of it or something. Who knows? Who knows? Who can say? It's but, got Tom Atkins in it. That's probably why. Right. It has Tom Atkins in it. It's got one of them su supernatural kids in it. And, uh, and the fucked up thing is the other Supernatural kid was in the Friday the 13th remake the same year. Right, right. I remember that being a big deal. And so I came to the original My Bloody Valentine later. And the edition we're going to be talking about tonight, or 
you know, I mean, the it, it's not so different than the theatrical. But we're talking about the unrated edition. I've got the Scream Factory version of it, which is, I guess, runs ninety three minutes, which is about eight minutes longer, I think. Yep, yep. I actually, ironically enough, I have the old Lionsgate DVD of the unrated cut. Okay, and I also have the Scream Factory, and oh. uh. Yeah. So I got to tell you, the thing that warmed my heart as I was watching uh, this again today, because I was listening to the director's commentary uh, from George Mahalka, and the number of times that he would stop and say, oh, you Scream Factory guys did such a good job. Oh, boy. I, I just I haven't seen the, some of these scenes since the first time that we assembled the movie, you know, back in 1981. And how how uh, pleased he was by some of the gore effects being back in, and pointed out some of the stuff that wasn't back in, and that kind of thing. But it was really kind of heartwarming to hear this guy see this movie, and you know, I think he said elsewhere that it's you know like eighty eighty five percent of what he had wanted to release, but the the mo original movie was going to get an X rating uh, because it was so. Uh, gruesome and yeah. you know yeah yeah like uh, the first time I ever seen this movie there's actually one kill that well it wasn't more of the kill it's more of the reveal of the kill later and I think you know what I'm talking about that kind of because I saw this at the right age probably too when I first watched this movie where I was like holy shit what the fuck <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, it's it's a pretty good film I think We'll talk about it on the back end, but it's definitely a movie that I don't know that I went into this month, you know, which was all kind of 80 slashers. Like we've already talked about April Fool's Day and Happy Birthday to Me, and now we're doing this one, and then to wrap up the month, we're doing Hell Night. So it's all these kind of 80s era slashers. Um, and, you know, fairly, I think, standard pools. You know, n none of these are, are too obscure. But My Bloody Valentine might be the one that I, I've had the most fun with. And think that it's, like, legitimately a pretty good movie and not just, like, that asterisk of, well, this is pretty good for a slasher. I think it's just a pretty good movie. And, I mean, it's gruesome, sure. It, it's a slasher. But it's got, like enough meat on the bones they're kind of interesting characters and there's a charm to it all uh there's a sense of humor in, in the movie um yeah. you know fink from meatballs is in it and there he is you know and this is the year that fink beats the miner um <laughs> and then it was because the other guy uh Spaz was in the happy birthday to me yeah yeah he was yeah sure was uh he was the the unsurprisingly the weirdo taxidermist that yeah the red herring of the movie yeah well there there are so many red herrings in that movie yeah Every, that movie's that movie that movie's a secret giallo you know what that's exactly what court said is this is like the the joke we made on that episode was it's like the plane took off headed for slasherville and had to make an emergency landing in giallo town yeah uh so, anyway, but we're not talking about Happy Birthday to me. That was last week. This week, we're uh, we're talking about My Bloody Valentine, and let's kind of jump into the plot because there's a fair amount of it, and I don't want to get too mired down in it because it is in typical slasher fashion of the time. It's as much a mystery as it is a slasher movie. Yeah, and I agree. You know it it. It's of the stripe. I'm trying to think of another good example of this. Like, Terror Train was something that somebody mentioned earlier as far as, like, oh, who is the killer? You know, and then we're, we're kind of following uh, the plot. But I think even in the mix of slasher movies where you don't know who the killer is, like the original Friday the 13th is kind of like that, too. Although it's not nearly as much of a mystery. It's just like, oh, it's Jason. Oh, no, it turns out it's not. This is very much a smartly written movie because it gives clues to who might be the killer 
and then it turns out that's not who it is but it's like oh okay well that was a, a nice head fake and I don't want to go any further without mentioning the writers of this uh, John Beard and uh, probably Beard is how you pronounce that and Stephen A. Miller and funnily enough John Beard also wrote My Bloody Valentine and Happy Birthday to Me yep so you know I one I prefer more than the other and also one didn't really have a script uh, for a while and then uh, Steve, and it turns out yeah. it's not My Bloody Valentine yeah, he's like, how do I put Glenn Ford in this movie? Yeah. Like, wait, it turns out that the killer is completely obvious? I think we've got a way around this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just nonsense. But um, And then Stephen Miller is kind of credited with the the story by sort of thing. Yeah, and yeah. He did a lot of writing for television. Like He, he wrote episodes of, of Airwolf and Magnum P.I., not the shitty new ones, the original ones, and that makes me happy. Yeah, John Michael Vincent, yo. Right? Did some uh, um, Simon and Simon. Oh, that's wicked old school. Yeah, right? <laughs> Did some Evening Shade with Burt Reynolds. <laughs> so, anyway, I I love uh, those, like, Ham and Egger writers who... We're just like, yeah, man, I was writing sitcoms. I was writing hour longs. Basically, if there was a mystery be to be solved and a bunch of knuckleheads had a robot partner, I was writing an episode of it. Um, yeah. And that's that's Stephen Miller, and God bless him. Anyway, like I said, let, let's jump into the plot here because I'm distracting myself. So the movie opens up with um, going down into the mine, a couple of miners going into the mine, and uh, we follow them into, you know, the darkness, and they kind of duck into an alcove. And this is where you get a, revel a revelation that one of the miners isn't a guy, it's a sexy lady. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so she takes off her, like, the miner's mask, the gas mask and the helmet, and that kind of thing is unzipping her, her workman suit. And you see that she's got a heart uh, tattoo on her chest. And yeah. so they're kind of making out. And she's like rubbing the mask and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's the kind of thing that you would pay specialty websites to watch. Yes. You know, it's a little bit kinky. And that's one of the things I like about this movie is that is there there is a... a weird kind of sexual vibe to a lot of this movie and not just the lover strangle and stuff like that some more in the margins kind of stuff and this is one of those things where even George Mahalka the director was like yeah you know there weren't a whole lot of movies doing BDSM stuff and I thought eh why not do, throw a little pepper in and hell, I, yeah. hell yeah right and I'm like you're right you know one thing movies don't have anymore is fucking and this movie's got a lot of it and I appreciate that. So, anyway, the one the miner who's keeping the mask on has kind of embedded his pickaxe in the wall. And then as they're making out, he grabs her, shoves her onto the pickaxe, and then the the you know the business end comes through her chest through the uh, tattoo of the heart. Which that's when we get the title card, right? Great. Yeah, it, it like it might as well start with a guitar solo. It rocks. And all right, so the town's name is Valentine's Bluff. <laughs> a little on the nose, but I'll take you. Sure. And they're gearing up for a Valentine's Day dance, which they haven't done in a long time because of uh, murder. And. Um, there's, uh, we've got, uh, the mayor who is this guy named Hanniger, and then he, uh, uh, is chatting with Mabel who runs the local laundromat mm -hmm. and he's like, well, you know, I don't know if this is such a good idea. It's been 20 years since we had this dance and Mabel's like, no, 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 it's going to be cool. And Mabel is in love with Jack 
the town chief of police and i think he's kind of got the hots for her too and as an older man Derek, i really appreciate the fact that we're getting a little like you know september romance going on in this movie yeah i kind of like that too because you don't really get a lot of like older like actors like interacting with each other in these type of movies especially during this time period it's mostly kids and it's cool to see adults like yeah you want to go out later on yeah he's like you know mabel we still got a little gas left in the tank yeah it's, it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of my two other favorite characters from the blob remake the sheriff in that movie and the uh, candy clark's character the waitress you yeah know, like, hey you want to go to this concert later <laughs> yeah it's great i i there are so many little things about this movie that I really like, and that's one of them. And I also like, spoilers, uh, Mabel gets murdered terribly, and it kind of fucks Jack up. And I like that, that he's like, man, I, you know, what am I going to do now? There are only so many options in this town of Valentine's Bluff in my age bracket. <laughs> and yeah. and the, the lady that I like got cooked, and that's fucked up. Um, anyway, all right, so... At the risk of jumping ahead a little bit, let's just kind of get, you know, the the story out, which is that there was a guy named uh, Harry Warden yep. who was a miner, and it turns out that there was an accident in the mine because a couple of the supervisors were were too wrapped around the axle about getting to this Valentine's dance and getting getting it wet. And because of their negligence, there was an explosion at the mine. And five men were trapped down there. Four of them were killed. There was a survivor, Harry Warden. But it took a while to get to him, and so he had to eat some of his buddies to survive. And when they got him out, uh, basically he went on a rampage and killed the people responsible for the explosion and yep. they had to send him to the giggle factory. Uh, I'm going to tell you this story. When I was a kid, I used to have like this weird fan fiction that this was a prequel to Rodan and they were really hunting Mega Nulon in the nice. mines. Nice. <laughs> and, uh. and so before he goes to the, uh, the booby hatch though, Harry Warden tells the town don't you ever hold another Valentine's Day dance? And here are the hearts of the two supervisors in this box of candy. And uh, and so then, you know, he's sent away where crazy people go. Yep. And so this is the first time in 20 years that they're going to have this dance. And we've got our cast of young people who are really excited about this. Um, you've got our love triangle, which is TJ who is this brooding guy who looks a little bit like um, the the guy from that Santana Smooth song, Rob Thomas. Rob, he looks like a little, like, if Rob Thomas and Casey Affleck had a kid together. Yeah, yeah, he, he's got that kind of vibe. And, and so he has gone away and come back, and when he left, he left behind his girlfriend, Sarah, and Sarah did not wait around for him, not knowing where the fuck he had gotten off to in the first place. So Sarah ended up hooking up with this guy named Axel. Not he was a, like his best friend, I think. Too. Yeah, who was a buddy of, of TJ's, which makes some sense that like, okay, TJ and Axel are buddies. Sarah was probably hanging around with him. And then once TJ lit off for Territories Unknown, Axel just kind of slipped in, was like, hey... You know, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know where TJ went either. And yeah. so the, there is some conflict, though, because Sarah has not completely gotten over TJ. She just didn't know where he was. Yeah. And wasn't going to sit around being a spinster. No. Nope. We should also mention that TJ is the mayor's son, which makes... He's like, this is my mind. Yeah. He actually... Yeah, they own the mine. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so um, we also have, uh, there's Hollis, who is Fink from Meatballs. And uh, 
then there's Sarah's friend Patty. There's the two virgins. Uh, I think. Uh, the, the, Dave, Dave, Tommy, yeah. Sylvia, John, they're all there. A bunch of them, but the important ones really are Axel, TJ, and Sarah. Yeah. And Hollis, just because I, I love him so much. Yeah, he's my spirit animal in this movie. Hollis is great. He's got an amazing mustache. He's got a, a ball cap that says, kiss my ass on it. And he's constantly drinking Moosehead. It is... Yes. It, oh, it is like chef's kiss Canadian. It is so good. Yes. And, uh, and Mahalka, the director on the commentary, talks about like, look, we just needed beer for them to drink and we had Moosehead as not really a sponsor, but we had the rights to show that. So everybody is drinking Moosehead. There are Moosehead, Moosehead signs everywhere. It's great. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So... Anyway, the mayor and Jake, the sheriff, are in Jake's truck when they open up a box of Valentine's chocolates. And it turns out there's a, a human heart in there um, from, you know, the lady we saw at the beginning of the movie. And yep. there's a note um, that says, like, hey, I thought I told you, told you, assholes, no Valentine's Day dances. Yeah. And so they end up having to go to the medical examiner who confirms like, oh, yeah, this is absolutely a human heart. Um, because I think the mayor was like, well, maybe it's a pig heart. And uh, but he confirms, no, 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 this is a human heart, probably about 30 years old. And it's possible Harry Warden has escaped from the giggle factory and is back wreaking his vengeance. Oh, yeah. And then mabel gets it i know we talked about the, her getting it earlier but she is getting um she's closing up the laundromat for the night and the killer comes after her and kills her with the pickaxe and it's a pretty good scene i really like the scene where mabel gets it not because um i, I want to see old women murdered but just because i think it's a well shot scene and i Mahalka himself talks about how it's kind of his black Christmas scene where you get kind of the killer POV going into the laundromat and so forth. Yeah, I like it too. Plus she's like looking at clues and stuff and, you know, then she finds the message that's right now for her and then bam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Harry Warden big on poetry. Um, <laughs> or, well, you know, we'll get to that in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but in between her death and her discovery, Hollis and a bunch of his buddies go to a junkyard and are cooking frozen dinners on engine blocks of cars. This is totally the junkyard from Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's another one of those things that I was like, this seems kind of weird, but I really like it. And it... <laughs> It makes sense for, like, the small town atmosphere. I can see, like, if I... Because I live in a small town. We used to hang in some weird fucking places, too. Well, and, and that's the thing is, George Mahalka, when they were kind of doing the location uh, scouting and that kind of thing, asked some of the locals, like, what do you guys do for fun? And they're like, oh, yeah, we just like to go to the junkyard and do some cooking on the engines and just hang out, drink some beer, sing some songs. And he was like, all right, that's going in the movie then. And, and so here we have it and but the point of the scene really is that like tj and axel talk about the fact that they used to be really close but they're not close anymore despite the fact that they can harmonize with harmonicas uh and that's disappointing yeah but they basically say like hey you know sarah uh, tj says like sarah wants to be with me axel is like oh fuck you no she doesn't and so we're at an impasse like they don't settle anything but to talk about this movie and not talk about the junkyard scene would be a crime. It would. Especially Hollis is pretty awesome in it. He is so good, man. He's so much fun in this movie. Um, he's just this big bear of a dude that constantly looks like he's having a good time. You know? Yeah, he's like, he's, and he, he, he's conflicted too. Like, I know we're going to jump a little ahead, but like when he like goes when you know axel and tj actually start falling down he's like he doesn't want to see his two best friends fucking fight each other he's like come on stop yeah 
Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's like the heart of the movie for me. Um, and yeah, I I agree. And when he goes, he dies kind of horribly too. And uh, yeah, I feel it makes you feel bad. Yeah. You know? So, so Jake, the uh, sheriff, calls up the the mental institution to ask about like, hey, did Harry Warden escape by any chance? And there, the lady secretary is like, look, we don't have any records of him, and that means he either was discharged or he died. But the one thing I can tell you is he is not here. His records have been lost, and I can't tell you where he is, what happened to him. All I know is that he ain't here now. And all we could look at is microfilm, and that's going to take a while. Yeah. So the mayor and the sheriff are like, oh, I bet it's Harry Warden, son of a bitch. And then they Jake goes to find Mabel to kind of let her know what's going on. And finds her body stuffed in one of the dryers dude this scene fucked me up as a kid it is gnarly and and they talk about how in the unrated version like the the fact that the body kind of flops around as the barrel of the dryer turns didn't happen in the theatrical version or at least not to the extent it does here but yeah like she is scorched up her heart's been ripped out of her chest it is gnarly yeah and so at this point they decide like we gotta cancel this dance um you know the, the harry warden is out we've two people have been killed already but before the word gets out to the rest of the kids there is a, a crazy ralph scene i love this dude <laughs> It was just the local bartender, and when all the kids are talking about how excited they are about the dance, he's like, "Well, Valentine's Day has a death curse. Harry Warden's gonna kill you." Yeah, and he, you know, this is where he kind of tells the whole story of Harry Warden and eating his friends and all that stuff. And he, the bartender overhears them say, "Well, if we can't have the official Valentine's Day dance." We're just going to go to the mine and we're going to party up there. And so the bartender is like, aha, I've got a great idea. I'm going to get these pesky kids and their meddling dog too. Dude, it's a he to totally looks like a Scooby-Doo character. His plan is totally a Scooby-Doo plan. He, yes. He goes to the mine, rigs up this mannequin in a in a you know mine worker outfit with a pickaxe to resemble Harry Warden and when you open the door it raises its axe he's got it like on a pulley system and he stands at the door opening this door to watch this mannequin move cackling like a fool yeah it's like his orgasm scene he's like ha ha and then you know when he walks away he's like I gotta do it one more time <laughs> yeah but the the last time he does it, sure enough, it's the actual killer who uh, puts the pickaxe right through his skull. And it's great. It's a good his one. eyeballs just hanging out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And apparently that was all going to be one shot also. Uh, yeah. But they've cut it up a little bit, even in the unrated version, that there's still some stuff missing here and there um, from what George Mahalko really wanted. But nonetheless that eyeball comes out of his head and it's a good eyeball like the special effects in this are genuinely pretty good yeah and so w with old man withers dead uh it, basically we go to uh valentine's day and a bunch of young kids show up at this mine like tj and Axel and Dave and uh, Dave by the way is the dude who gets murdered in the kitchen um, yep. as Harry Warden begins his, his assault on these kids he's cooking hot dogs and gets his face shoved into the hot dog water so his head gets boiled alive and he gets himself a chocolate starfish after that too yeah and, oh yeah, gets his heart cut out, and that gets thrown in the boiling water. Um, it's pretty good. 
and uh it also when when some kids are in there getting uh hot dogs and beer his body is shoved in the into in the fridge and nobody notices at all which is pretty fun yeah it's great yeah the, oh man so much fun shit in this movie and so uh the chief also gets another candy box and with another heart in there and there's a note that says like you didn't stop the party and the chief is like wait a second we stopped the dance what party is going on you know what like i thought we had avoided all of this and then one of the best scenes of the movie comes up when john and sylvia are the the characters names are are making out in the showers and yep. one of the features of the showers is that you can hang, like miners can take off their clothes and use a pulley to hang uh, their clothes up yep. above the showers. And she ends up, uh, John goes off to, to grab some beer. Um, she ends up getting attacked by our killer but the whole scene is like these clothes dropping down from the ceiling all around her. And then she just spins around at one point and surprise, surprise, there's our killer who grabs her by the head and jams her, her skull on a shower nozzle. It's great. Dude, it is, you know, again, I, I, I it's hard for me to speak to the theatrical version because I've only seen that maybe once. It's always kind of been the the unrated version but the thing i'm really pleased by and surprised by when i watch this movie is like man this movie does not pull punches you know like it it goes for it there are no off-screen kills or anything well there are some but you get the results later i mean yeah it's yeah, gnarly because i actually did watch the unrated version i mean the rated version uh, let's see where I watched that. It was like probably around Valentine because it was on Shutter. I was just lazy. I didn't want to get my Blu-ray out of it. It was on there. And man, it's like a totally... Because I watched the unrated cut first. That was my first time ever watching this movie. And man, it's like a, a letdown watching it. Like, you got to watch the unrated version of this movie to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think that... I don't think the movie is sadistic. You know, like, there are some movies that feel like it, they're just taking great pleasure in hurting the characters. It's just like, oh, shit, that would be a terrible way to go, you know? <laughs> like Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah, Rob Zombie movies, uh, like, the especially those hostile sequels, where you, I can yeah. kind of defend the first one, but after that, it feels like we're just here to watch people getting hurt. And, yeah. but for the most part, like these are all characters that we've kind of seen at, you know, sitting around the table, drinking beer, having a good time. And yeah, none of them know them before it happened, you know? Yeah. And none of them are jerks, you know, like maybe Axel and TJ are kind of jerks with one another, but everybody just seems like, it seems like a small town where everybody just goes to the bar on Friday nights, gets loaded, dan does some dancing and has a good time. Yeah. And so when they go, you know, when they're killed by the, our, our mysterious killer, it genuinely is kind of a bummer. And, uh, you know, even with these kind of minor characters, in fact, the, the two characters um, that I was talking about, the virgins, it's Michael and Harriet are the characters' names. And they're both virgins. And it's, again, part of that sexuality in this movie that's kind of hovering around the edges where they're both kind of nervous about it. But they end up getting it on. And, I mean, they get murdered for their trouble. But it's one of those things of like, oh, you know, I kind of hope that these kids make it out. But they sure as fuck don't. Uh, nope. So Dave ends up getting killed. Sylvia's uh, boyfriend as well. Um, and then Hollis it, is like, hey, if you guys want to go deeper into the mine, we can go down there and party. And so he, Hollis goes down with Patty, who's his girlfriend, Sarah's buddy. And Sarah goes with them. And then there's um, Howard, who is a guy. 
he is the more likable Shelly from uh, Friday. He, he does 3. look like Shelly. <laughs> looks he even has the same fro. Yeah, he looks like Shelly. He also does the the pranks, you know, does like special effects and stuff. And he's a little bit irritating, but he is nowhere at the Shelly ballpark. He's actually Every, everyone in that Friday the Thirteenth Part Three is irritating. Even that fucking boyfriend of the main chicks there, I fucking hate that dude in that movie. I don't even remember that character. It's hard for me to watch that one. Uh, I I agree yeah. with you. I don't like anybody in that movie. Just the biker gang. I wish they were just the stars. Yeah. Now a biker gang versus uh, Jason is a perfectly fine movie, but as soon as you bring Shelley and his ilk into it, um. You know, people will often say, well, but that's where Jason got his hockey mask. And I'm like, not worth it. It is not worth that iconic hockey mask to have to deal with Shelly. I'll, I'll give me the bag and with the one eye any day. Just give me the mongoloid. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. How about no mask at all? How about he just walks around being scary? Anyway. Yeah. It's a, the, the, neither the time nor the place to relitigate Friday the 13th part mm -hmm. 3 I know a lot of people coming soon like, yeah yeah mm -hmm. at some point I will roll through that series mm -hmm. or pick and choose and I will probably do part 3 just to just to reevaluate it I, I it's been long enough that I don't hate it the way that I do for about 6 months after I see it and I, I need I need to go back and see if I just if, if that hatred is deserved that should be this episode of Tick Six Movie where you just do part three. You just do Friday the 13th 3 and Highlander 3. Yeah. Mm. Prophecy 3. <laughs> uh, A plan is forming. Yeah. Yeah. It could, it could happen. In the words of Gene Wilder from Young Frankenstein. It could work. <laughs> but back to my bloody Valentine. Yeah. So, um... They find, uh, uh, this girl Gretchen finds Dave dead in the freezer. You know, the guy who got boiled. Yep. And so he runs in, um, or she, uh, and, and John, one of the other kids are like, oh yeah, Sylvia's dead too. And they all decide like, oh, Harry Warden is probably back in, in town. And so everybody kind of leaves and runs except for TJ and Axel who go down into the mine to find Hollis and Howard and Patty and Sarah and uh, Michael and uh, Harriet who are the virgins. Yep. And so speaking of them, they go off into an engine room to get it on and the killer gets an auger and screws, literally screws them to death. Yeah, and the description that the director gave of what this scene was supposed to be, because they were like, "Look, we, we you just got to cut all of this out. <laughs> you know, like you can't have any of this scene." Because you know, he talks about how in uh, their discussions with the MPAA, there were certain moments that they were like, "Okay, you got to trim a little bit here and trim a little bit there." He said for this scene, they were like, you can't have none of this. But the scene was that while they're in, in mid-coitus, the killer jams the auger into this kid Michael's back, at which point he arches his back and thrusts harder, mm -hmm. which gets her off. And then he you know, the killer twists the auger through both of them and they end up falling onto one another with blood dripping from the dude's mouth into hers. And the way that George uh, Hamalka put it is in this eternal kiss as he like, it's him losing his bodily fluids into her, yep. but it, instead of semen, it's blood. Yeah. And that's the point where the MPAA was like, nope they can find them all you know all stabbed with this auger and he was like yeah but when they're having sex nope none of that is going in the movie you are not going to see them having sex you are not going to see them getting drilled in the back you're not going to see him come you're not going to see her come you're not going to see him dribble blood into 
her, her mouth and you're not going to see them stuck together kissing one another for eternity. So get that right out of your head. Now they can be found. And so this whole scene apparently was just even in the unrated version just doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, which is a bummer because it sounds like a really cool scene and really like transgressive and interesting and uh, eh, it's, you know good good on you. Fucking MPA. I, I like the fact that they were going for it. You know I appreciate yeah. that from this movie. Um, yeah. But yeah so Hollis then finds their bodies and he is trying to get away but he drops his hat with the lamp on it and while he's getting that the killer loads up a nail gun and drives oh. a nail into hollis's head and all of a sudden he's like oh i'm feeling a little woozy and the killer hits him a couple of more times with the nail gun and he just staggers back towards the others and collapses dead and uh meanwhile the miner our killer kind of disappears down a tunnel and once Hollis is out of the picture, Howard, the only other dude in this group, just books. He's like, I, I wish you all the best. I will see you later. I am gone. He's also a little smarter, Shelly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of self-preservation, he's no hero. That's for sure. Yeah. But he, yeah, he hauls ass. And so now it's just Patty and Sarah alone in this mine. And shortly thereafter, Axel and TJ show up, um, although coming from different directions. I yeah, think. not together. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we need to get you all back up. But the control panel to the mining cart has been screwed with, so we can't take the mining cart back up. And the elevator isn't going to work either, so we're going to have to climb up this ladder that's like a kilometer high. Yeah. And so they start climbing it and they get part of the way up when Howard's body <laughs> drops from above them and like it, there's a, a rope wrapped around his neck. It doesn't help. <laughs> his fucking his whole body just falls off his head. <laughs> Dude, yeah, when this rope snaps taut, his head goes flying, the body falls, blood splashes all over them. <laughs> It's great. It is such it is. a good death. And and so now they're like, oh shit, Harry Warden is above us, so we got to go back down into the mine. And so they run back down there, and they hear um, Axel scream from behind him. And so they go to investigate, and it looks like he's fallen down into uh, a well. And that, like, you just see his mining helmet with the lamp on it sink into this muck and TJ's like well that's it Axel's gone They're... come on Sarah let's go <laughs> yeah I mean look I'm sure one way or the other we'll figure out how to, how to get you over this tragedy and so meanwhile above ground the sheriff has been told because uh, like all a bunch of the kids that saw the body in the fridge have come back to town and are like, Hey sheriff, you need to get to the mine because Harry warden has shown up and is killing kids up there. And so he grabs, uh, the local posse and heads up to the mine to, you know, save the kids. And so, uh, Patty gets it in the gut, uh, back at the mine when the killer just kind of steps out of nowhere and slams a, a pickaxe into her belly. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of like him, uh, the, the killer chasing Sarah and TJ around until they're, they're in like this abandoned tunnel. Mm -hmm. And the tunnel will be after TJ and the killer start fighting, the uh, tunnel starts to collapse and uh, the my uh, the killer's pickaxe gets caught in the like a support beam, and so he's gonna kill Sarah with a hunting knife. And uh, in the meantime, they've been like 
fighting each other on top of this mining cart that was running up. And in a scene I really like, um, they, they jump off the the cart that's kind of leading up the tunnel, presumably to safety. And they're wrestling down deeper in the mine. But when you cut to the sheriff and his men, you yeah. see that cart passing by them. Yeah. And it's like, like oh, yeah, like they're close. And so as they're fighting, they pull off the killer's mask. Surprise, surprise. Dun, dun, dun. Turns out it was Axel all along. And we get a flashback that shows us, oh, when he was a kid, Axel was the son of one of the administrators who got murdered. And he got murdered right in front of Axel, who was hiding under the bed. And saw, like, you know, blood splatter across the, the bed and that kind of thing. Dude, when they took that mask off, my fucking mouth dropped the first time I've ever seen this. Because I had no fucking idea. Yeah, well, I mean, they certainly position it that, okay, it could be Harry. There's, uh, you know, the actual Harry Warden. There is some, you know, indication that, oh, maybe it's TJ. You know, he left and came back and... So the movie does a pretty good job of hiding who the real killer is. And even when, even when they finally reveal it's Axel, it's one of those things, like when you get the flashback to like, oh, here's why he's crazy. Um, and there are some cases where I think that kind of sucks, you know, where it's like, oh, well now we understand why he's the killer. Um, it kind of works for me in this movie in a way that it doesn't in a lot of others. And maybe it's just because I've built up so much goodwill watching this movie so far that it's like, Oh, okay, well that makes sense. Or if I've just seen it enough now that I'm like, Oh yeah, Axel's the killer. But there are also little clues dropped in the movie that it's him. Yeah. Um, like when he grabs uh Patty the earlier in the movie, he grabs her by the head the same way he does when he, uh, not Patty, but one of the other girls, when he jabs her head on the shower nozzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that of like, oh, okay, so if you know who it is, you can kind of watch his behavior, and, and it makes sense. It tracks. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, so anyway, the, uh, the cavalry arrives, the tunnel is collapsing, bearing Axel under a bunch of rocks and timbers and they think he's dead but then they see his hand moving and Sarah and a bunch of the other guys try to grab his hand and pull him out and meanwhile on the other side of the rocks Axel <laughs> saws through his own trapped arm like a wounded fox nice. yeah. yeah and just takes off and says, Sarah, be my bloody Valentine. Yeah, he's like, Harry and I'll be back. We'll be back. Meanwhile, they never come back. But yeah, yeah, and you're right. The last line of the movie is him saying, Sarah, be my bloody Valentine. And then you get the this ballad. Irish folk song. Yeah, this ballad of Harry Warden. And I look, one thing that will do my heart good is if your movie has its own theme song. And this is a pretty good one. I love it. It's like, I like. I just want like this album on like on vinyl just to listen to this fucking song over and over again. Yeah, apparently there were uh, they never released an actual soundtrack, or at least not, you know, uh, concurrently with the movie or anything, which is kind of crazy. But um, yeah, it's waxwork wet waxwork records. If you listen to this. My bloody Valentine on the soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know that there was ever like a vinyl issue of this. I mean, there you you can probably get it at this point because there were so many boutique outlets for that kind of thing. But yeah, especially with uh, Paul Zaza did the soundtrack for this movie, and you know, if he, if it is a Canadian horror movie, he most likely did the scores. <laughs> he did like all the prom nights. Yeah. You know, the they they talk about it in the director's commentary how 
he did even like the country and western music that they're listening to in the bar and the guy just had a million different gears you know it's it's really really good it's so fun um yeah uh uh i just i love it so much um and that's the movie that's that's the plot uh so let's let's jump into the cast which is um a really good young cast and most of them went on to do other stuff you know like we've certainly given keith knight the guy who plays hollis and was fink and meatballs his day in court he had an incredible run of doing voice acting work for a lot of animated stuff as well um Mm -hmm. but then you've got paul kelman as uh as tj who's kind of the lead and he doesn't have a long run as an actor like he did this and a movie called gas roses yeah he was like somebody's dad and in black roses uh, but I like him in this. I think he's really good. Yeah. Uh, you've got Lori Hallier, I believe is how you pronounce her name, who played Sarah in the film. And she has been working, like, this was her first feature film. And she has been working since then. Like, she's got stuff that is in pre-production right now. Um, so, good for her. A lot of those, like, you know, lifetime Christmas movies are thrown in the mix, but I ain't holding that against anybody. That that sounds to me like they gotta eat. Yeah, that sounds like being a working actor. And um, and I think she's really good in this. Like she's a strong character, and you know there is that kind of requisite scene where TJ and Axel are fighting over her, and she's like, "I don't belong to either of you." And I will decide who who it is that I'm going to be with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Neil Affleck plays Axel. And he was in Scanners, which is crazy. Uh, but he, again, another guy who's been kind of acting uh, for a while, has done a lot of a lot of acting work, has done a lot of editing uh for a lot of movies uh a lot of movies and tv he also shows. works he also works for uh animation he works on family guy yeah sure enough D- yeah direct some episodes of directed some episodes of the simpsons too so yeah. like again good good on you you have put together a fine career in show business um and he's a of of the like the main three or four actors, I think he might be the weakest in my estimation. But he, you know, he's still not bad. He, he, he kind of looks a he's like he kind of looks like a poor man's Aaron Eckhart. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good good call. Um, then let's see, Cynthia Dale is yeah. Patty. She's, uh, you know, Sarah's friend, and she, again, working actress, been been doing uh, TV and movies for a long time, and still apparently is. Um, the, the, the main girl I recognize is Helene Udi as Sylvia. She was in another movie a year later called The Incubus. Yeah. Uh, with John Ca- with, with the penis demon that kills people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Um, and also another actor who is in all kinds of shit. Um, yeah, like again, totally a working actor, still, still doing it. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of amazing. It kind of reminds me of, uh, April Fool's Day in that it's like, this is a really good cast of like young actors who most of whom went on to do other stuff. They, they may not have been you know household names but isn't fucking biff in that movie yeah yeah tom wilson sure enough yeah yeah <laughs> and uh yeah like uh ken oland who was in summer school and a bunch of other stuff yep. and um you know but you've got don franks in in this movie as your uh your sheriff the chief and he was in a bunch of stuff as well i mean again just a solid canadian actor 
And yeah, I mean, it's like my bloody Valentine is eaten up with good Canadian actors who worked forever. You know, like Don Franks is sadly no longer with us. He died in April of 2016. His last screen credit is in 2016. So, you know, he worked from the like 50s on. Is that right? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was, <laughs> he was in um, television shows in the late 50s. And yeah. So he's, he's MVP because he's in fucking heavy metal. <laughs> no kidding, man. Also was in the TV series Alf. Yeah. So, you know, that ain't too bad either. Um, yeah, just a, a, like a, a really solid all-around cast. Um, not a whole lot of weak links. And for this kind of movie, for the time it was made, I think it's one of the better casts for these kinds of movies. I agree, because they all feel real, like real people. You know, even like, you know, Axel's kind of shitty in some scenes, but, you know, even when he's together with the friends and stuff and they're like joking around and shit, he works well with the other cast members, you know? So it all works well at the end for me, for this movie. Yeah. Um. So talking briefly about the themes of this film, um, I think you can argue maybe it it has something to say about childhood trauma but it, mm. it's it's a little stretch i mean it's you mostly know. just a mystery like this is a roller coaster ride there's not you're not supposed to walk away from this movie with themes and shit like that right like understanding more about your place in the universe or something this is just like hey sit down sit your ass down for 90 minutes and there there are going to be thrills and chills and some laughs and at the end of it, you're gonna have had a good time. But 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 the major theme that I like that, that I like that's in this movie is like the inner small town area atmosphere. You get the feel of the small town and the characters, and that's pretty much you feel like you're watching somebody's life in a small town, which ends up having a fucking guy in a mining outfit <laughs> killing people. You know? Yeah. I yeah, I think you're totally right. I think that yeah, the big takeaway is like this feels authentic in a way that a lot of these movies don't. Like the, the all of yeah. these kids and they're not kids, like they're all working age. They're you know, people who work in the mine and live in this small town. It feels like this it like them hanging out in the junkyard and cooking shit on the engine blocks. Like that is the kind of thing that feels real and because it is because it's a thing that people in that town did and you know good on George Mahalka for going out of his way to try to find those real moments and and even like the relationship between Mabel and Jake and all of that stuff feels like these are real characters leading real lives and you know that's kind of the the uh, the test of characters in a movie is okay if these murders weren't going on can you imagine what these characters life would be like outside of the you know boundaries of this movie and it's like oh yeah you know where I say if you go to summer <laughs> let's go to meatballs <laughs> yeah yeah uh, like these these are people who when they have kids will send their kids to the meatballs camp uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. All right. So enough about themes. Enough of that hoity-toity bullshit. Let's get to final thoughts and ratings. And you go first this time. What, where, When you walk away from this movie, what are you thinking? And also, of course, give us a rating. Uh, one out of five stars. Half stars are allowed, but uh, no quarter stars because we're not monsters. Uh, hit me. Well... I was kind of shocked that no one picked this in the group chat, Bo, because this is actually my favorite slasher of all time. Okay, all right. So it's gonna, you know, my rating might be kind of a thing of nostalgia going into it, too, but also yeah, you know, people could pick this movie apart, but the thing I like about it 
it's just the characters. The characters make this one so much better. And the kills are great. And like, yeah, you know, they're not too fucking in your face. Like, you know, like hatchet in your face or it's just slow-mo watching this person's jaw getting ripped off. The kills are great, simple, and authentic. Yeah. And that's what I like about this movie. And it has some good jump moments that still get me. Like, when fucking Mabel comes out of that dryer, I'm like, what the fuck? And, you know, I, I want that, re- you know, I love watching this movie with people that haven't seen it before. Because I like to watch people when they're watching movies. I'm like one of those viewers. And I want them to jump when they see that happen, you know. Like, you know, that's like a thing that, oh, oh, I wish I could have that again where I just watch this for the first time again. You know, it's a movie I love very dearly. And, you know, I'm glad Screen Factory did great with this transfer. Because even those like the uncut scenes like on the original DVD weren't the greatest and I was just blown away how they clean these up mm, they look amazing mm-hmm. on this Blu-ray and you know uh, it's a movie that stayed with me like I just watched it. it's like comfort food movie for me so yeah this might be my first five out of five on this show I love this movie man all right, all right. I uh, I'm gonna come in a little bit lower, but not much, not much, because I think I agree with all this. I think it's really fun. I think the characters are good. I think the kills are good. I think it it does capture this kind of feeling of a like a small town community, maybe better than any slasher I can think of off the the top of my head. <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but even that, this feels like that's just a bunch of kids in a suburban neighborhood. This one, you, you're yeah. you're going to the bars with them, you're going to the junkyard, they're going to the mine to party. All of that stuff feels legitimate Hell, like, and real. Yeah, for sure. And another thing I forgot that I love movies set in mines. Like, like I mentioned Rodan earlier. Mm-hmm. I love the whole beginning of Rodan because it's all in the, like this mining community. You know, like, I want, that's, a, that's a double feature for you folks. Rodan and fucking My Bloody Valentine. You could do a lot worse. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's really, really good. And, it, and it's fun and it's kind of sexy. And, you know, like it's not a... Even though it addresses sexuality and that kind of thing, it's not just like, oh, this actor is going to show their boobs and then we're going to murder them. It like sex is kind of just discussed in this movie in a way that's strangely mature, you know, like it's not again, not high minded or anything, but just characters talking about like the two virgin characters like getting teased about it but also you get the sense that like oh yeah they're kind of approaching that point and looking forward to it and um you know it's like it's not just the dirty thing you do that that gets you killed yeah and uh and i really like that part of it as well and it's it's kind of funny and and the kills are horrifying uh so yeah i think this is like a solid four and a half I'm not quite at five star level, but it's it ain't far. Yeah, I, I can accept that. You know, it's not. You know, that, it's still a pretty high rating for you too. Absolutely. Know, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it's just crazy. Like uh, this movie didn't really do great when it came out and shit. And you know, it's like it just stands the test of time now, especially with like these new editions coming up. It's, you know, like. Africa. it's even getting a fucking board game which is mind blowing which I might actually fucking pitch into that Kickstarter <laughs> yeah I I would love to see like a I don't know there's part of it that part of me that's like you know what this just lives as such a wonderful little gem of a movie that I don't need a sequel like even the remake now uh, even though I saw that first is such a pale imitation of this one um, yeah. That I, I'm just kind of uh, like I just like this movie. It's sort of like Black Christmas, where it's like a holiday themed horror movie that I can go back to that I like just because it's a good movie, not because it's like a, a good excuse to watch uh, 
this on Valentine's Day. It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you need that as an excuse. But if you've never seen My Bloody Valentine, you should just watch My Bloody Valentine because it, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, before we wrap this up, it's time for three things that you may not know about My Bloody Valentine. Dun, dun, dun. So, um, the, the guy who played Axel, Neil Affleck, said that uh, the, the identity of who the killer was was kept a secret from everybody in the cast, including him. But he figured it out before he was told by anybody because he was sent to the makeup department so that they could fit him for a fake arm. Oh. So he was like, oh, what's this uh, fake arm for? And they're like, uh, nothing. And he was like, I'm the killer, aren't I? And they're like, no. Um, anyway, th that's kind of fun. Uh, another thing, Derek, that you may not know about, uh, about my, 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 blah, 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 my bloody Valentine is that one of the reasons cited for the MPAA wanting so many cuts is that this movie was going to be released just after John Lennon was murdered. Uh -huh. And so a lot of the MPAA or the, the scuttlebutt was that they were kind of getting strict about violence in movies in general. And I don't know if you paid attention during the talk about the plot, my bloody Valentine violent as shit. Uh, so yeah. got cut up a little bit. Yeah, this and Friday too were butchered. All right, so uh, I've got two more. Normally it's three. We're gonna do four. Number three is they when they were shooting, they were actually shooting down in a mine, and because the you know plot point of the movie of these methane explosions, that's a very real thing. And so they couldn't leave equipment down there. So every night, yeah. they would have to take an elevator down with the whole cast, along with all the equipment, set it all up, and then at the end of the, the day shooting, pack everything up, take it to the elevator, take it all back up and do it every day, just in case a methane buildup happened and exploded and destroyed all their equipment. Uh, which sounds like an incredible pain in the ass when you are making a movie. It does. And then... That's nuts. Yeah. And then finally, the the last thing that you may not know about uh, this here My Bloody Valentine movie is that when uh, George Mahalka decided that they were going to shoot at this mine in Nova Scotia, a place called the Sydney Mines, um, he liked it because it looked kind of old and run down and, and so forth. But the locals got wind of the fact that a director was going to come and make a, a movie in their old mine. And so the town pitched in and raised $50,000 to have the mine completely cleaned up and painted white. And so mm -hmm. when they returned, George Mahalka and the crew showed back up and they were like, what happened to the mine? It looked so terrible before. And now it looks all clean and, and sparkly. The way that uh, George Mahalka put it was, it was like a, a mine you would see in a Disney movie. And they were like, well, we <laughs> we thought you would like a nice clean mine for your movie. And he was like, no, it's supposed to be dingy and scary. So they had to spend $75,000 more of the movie budget to bring in a bunch of people to make the mine look like it did before the town ever spent $50,000 to clean it up. <laughs> a lot of money was spent that day. Yeah, a lot of money spent to make the mine look crappy. Um, but that are, uh, are those are the three things, uh, well, four really, that you may not know about... Uh, my bloody Valentine. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Um, whether uh, whether you are listening at home or in your car uh, or in a school library, perhaps. I hope that you said to yourself, "Holy shit! I didn't know that about my bloody Valentine." In which case, our work here is done, Derek. 
and it's done. Uh, all right. Well, hey, man. Um, and like I said, thanks, thanks very much for doing this. Before we cut you loose, uh, where can people find more out of you? Sure. Uh, you can find me in my main show, Cinema Attack, which is on Anchor.fm. We just released a. Speaking of shitty movies, <laughs> <laughs> we just did a commentary on the movie Skin Deep. Wow. What Whoa. is that? That sounds familiar. Oh. Let's just say if you ever want to see a movie where Warwick Davis plays a character named Plates, where his character just throws plates at people. Uh, I, that is not necessarily something I want to watch. Uh, <laughs> is this... All right, hold on. From 89? Yeah, Gabe told this directed. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's the Blake Edwards movie. Hold on. Uh, I have no idea what what this movie is. Does, does it have an alternate title? No, it's called Skin Deep. Huh. All right. Well, it would be a good it would be a good one for Pick Six movies. It would be a great episode, actually. I'll I'll have to take your word for it. There there are a bunch of movies called Skin Deep. Hold on, let me. I'll keep going, uh, and I'll see if I can find this thing. Uh. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that should be out uh, uh, probably around the same time. This is uh, uh, still in that, but it should be out by around the time this episode's out. Also, you can find me on No More Room in Hell, where we just released an episode on uh, Perfect Blue and uh, Pearson. Great episode there, where we had uh, Nikki Williams uh, from the Slumber Party Massacre on that episode. Good show. One of my favorite episodes we recorded of that. And you could also find me on uh, the sideshow of No More Room in Hell, Creature Comforts. Actually released today of this recording was the episode we did on uh, Alligator. I saw that and, uh, just hit. I'm very excited to listen to that. I, I love me some Alligator. Yeah. And the, the next episode of that, uh, I'll announce, I think is going to be Peter Himes' The Relic. Oh, also good. That's that's I quality like, yeah, Tom like, Sizemore. It is. It's good. I like that movie a lot. And uh yeah, that's about it for me. All my other shows are on like you know, like hiatus. Sure. But uh yeah, that's about it. Excellent. I did track down Skinned Deep. And uh yeah, that looks terrible. Uh described yeah, as a, a pick stick. Yeah, described as a comedy, sci-fi, horror, thriller, romantic drama. Oh, the, if you ever do like a fan month of Pick Six movie, <laughs> I'm totally fucking picking that. Uh, uh. <laughs> I even have it on my computer. I can just send it to you. You don't even have to spend money. <laughs> nah, nah. I I feel like I would have to. Um, but it yeah. actually just got a Blu-ray from Severance. Uh. <laughs> Man, and they'll, they'll give a Blu-ray to everything except for Moby Dick. I've been trying to find a good Blu-ray of Moby Dick forever. The, the Gregory Peck one? Yeah. Yeah, I think eventually it'll come out. I know uh, Twilight Times, you know, that company that releases like limited Blu-rays, like a thousand copies. They released it and I think it's out of print now. Yeah, that right. That is the copy to get, and even in like the the secondhand market is you know one hundred and fifty two hundred dollars for a copy of that. Thing. Yeah, I sometimes you just wait on that. I know Kino Lorber, but they add on on DVD. So hopefully, because they did that with the train also, mm-hmm. and then they later released that on Blu Ray. Maybe that will happen. Knock on wood. But uh, yeah, don't hold me to that. But hopefully, Kino Kino's been putting out good shit lately. Yeah, yeah. Uh... All right, man. Well, enough of my Moby Dick complaints. Uh, Thanks again for doing this, and uh, I'll be right back to close up the show. Bye. And there you have it. One great big honking love fest about My Bloody Valentine. Uh, As as I said in that conversation, I'm I'm not really the biggest fan of slashers. It's not my my favorite subgenre of horror. And that, I think, is reflected when we talk about things like, you know, April Fool's Day and Happy Birthday to me, which I'm... You know, I think are interesting, but I'm a little middling on. This movie, on the other hand, My Bloody Valentine, 
is a movie that I'm not only happy to have on the shelf, I can pull it off and watch it just any old time. I think it's terrific. If you've never seen the original My Bloody Valentine, or more precisely, if you haven't seen the director's cut that, uh, you know, Scream Factory uh, put out not so very long ago, I highly, highly recommend it. It's fun. It's gory. It's got good characters. It's got a sense of humor. It's really everything that I kind of want out of a slasher movie. And, and the mystery isn't bad. You know, it's a little perhaps convenient at the end, but that's fine. It works. It, it, it's enough for the movie to hang its hat on. And uh, I appreciate that. So, um, what is coming, uh, guys, a ton of stuff. Um, not only do we have one more episode in our April Slashers series, which is going to be, uh, Hell Knight, which that's going to be with Jerry Cortez. And let me tell you, anytime Jerry Cortez, AKA Mr. Venom is on the show, it is a, a real beat up kind of situation for me because he's just so smart. He knows a lot about the filming of the movies. And when you hear the conversation, we get kind of deep into the production and, uh, how this movie came to be and so forth. And it was just a, a grand time uh, that I had talking about both that movie because we both have a, a weird personal connection to the movie. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy that conversation. So not only we, do we have that, in May there's going to be this whole series about aquatic horror movies. And, you know, uh, I don't have a, a pithy name for that just yet. So if you have any thoughts on it, you can uh, shoot that over to me on uh, Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. You can find us on Facebook in uh, in the groups under the Dark Parade, and uh, there you can also find a a link to the Discord. And to be honest, the Discord is where I am monitoring more than anything else. You know, and my my ever increasing desire to get away from social media. Uh, if I could just get everybody on the Discord server then I would just say farewell to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, anyway, enough of my grumbling about social media. Uh, we have the Aquatic Horrors next month. You're going to get new Heart of Horror. You're going to get new What You're Watching with Jamie and Bo. Um, we've got the lineup uh, assembled for June as well. And there's some other stuff that I'm really excited about doing and I think you're going to start seeing that around June. Uh, I'm starting to get well ahead on my recording schedule, which means I've got a little extra time to do some things that are off the beaten path and require a little bit more time. Um, I, one thing I've really been wanting to do is more interviews, and I think I'm going to start having the time to do those. And, and hopefully some interviews that are kind of interesting and different and, and not just... Hey, here's a guy or gal who happens to be in a movie that's coming out pretty soon, but to get a little deeper into, um, you know, various subjects that I'm interested in and hopefully you will be too. So, uh, more on that as, uh, as I, I get deeper into that stuff. So that is going to do it for this, uh, this episode of the dark parade. I really appreciate the fact that, uh, you've taken the time to spend a little bit with us. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you had a good time. And please join us again for more slasher movies, for more waterborne hor uh, horror movies. You heard it here first. The next series in June will be Universal Monsters, and uh, that, that is coming together uh, quite well. I'm very excited to talk about some of that stuff. So uh, until next time, everyone, thanks again, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.